Let's try to find it. It was the um, where is it? It was a it was an example. Um, it was on it was on number one from example six point seven point three. Okay. As and I understood all of it up to the point where they multiplied the denominator by the numerator, and I was wondering why they did that exactly. Um, okay, so this one, right, so Rosenthal's rule only applies in zero over zero or infinity over infinity, so is it one of those types of forms? Mm -hmm. No, uh, but what form is it? Well, this looks like it's going to zero, and this looks like it's going to, well, this x is going to zero, so one over zero is going to infinity, so e raised to infinity is going towards infinity. So this is like a zero times infinity form, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's not in one of these two forms here. So what we have to do is some algebra on this, get it into the correct form. So you can divide it by a fraction, basically. Yeah, so we, we, write, we take x and we flip it, and then we flip it again, basically what you do. So you get e to the x, one over x, over one over x. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the reason you do that, whoops, that's a zero, is because now it looks like infinity over infinity. The top will go towards infinity, the bottom will go towards infinity. So we can use L'Hopital's rule on that. So what does L'Hopital's rule say? It says take the derivative of the top and put it over the derivative of the bottom. The derivative of each of those pieces, let's see, so one over x, is x to the minus one. So if you do the derivative of the bottom, you get minus x to the minus two. You take the derivative of the top, well, derivative of the top is always the e, because it's an e, but then you multiply by the derivative of the power. And the derivative of the power is minus x to the minus two, and maybe that's what you're talking about. So it's a chain rule. Wait, I'm sorry, can you repeat that exactly? Because I thought you were, I think you only found a derivative for both f and g function separately, not together, because it's... That's what we're doing. So the derivative, so the bottom is one over x, mm -hmm. x to the minus one. Yes. The derivative will be negative one x to the negative two. So that's mm -hmm. the bottom. Yes. The derivative of the top, well, I got to have e to the one over x. So how do you take a derivative of e? It's always the same thing again, e to the one over x, but then the chain rule says you got to multiply by the derivative of the power. Oh, okay, that makes sense. Yeah, and then those cancel and you'll get infinity. All right, great, thank you. Okay, here's what I'm gonna start off on is uh, look at uh, the answers for test two very quickly. Once again, if you have questions, uh, probably just write them down, save them for, uh, for later, if we have time, or in an email, uh, either way is fine. So um, here we go. So this is the first one, and um, this has a couple different ways to do it, but one is this, pat this realization that you can pull a two, uh, because it's x squared, you can put the two in front instead. Uh, and if you do this, then this is the straight up u substitution, u equals natural log, du is one over x, dx, and when you substitute in, you'll get two times the integral of one over u du. So u sub is the technique. Uh, when you integrate that, you'll get two times the natural log of u. Um, and um, going to, what am I doing? I am going a little nuts here, a little bit too fast. This is not one over u, it's just u. That was the whole point of doing it. There's u right there, so u du. So when I integrate 2u, I get u squared. And then when I replace that back in, it'll be, it's kind of weird. It's the natural log of x squared plus t. Now, if you didn't know to bring this 2 down, and instead, you could have just said, well, let's let u equal the natural log of x squared completely without taking this 2 down. Well, then du is a little bit trickier, but it's, you take, uh, 1 over x squared, and then we multiply by the derivative of the inside, which is 2x. So there's a little bit of chain rule there. It is a chain rule there. 
And so when you substitute that in, it turns out this two will come over as a half in this case. So it'll be one half the integral of u uh, for this particular u set. So that'll be one quarter u squared. So then when you replace, you get one quarter u natural log of x squared squared plus c. And that's just another way. These are the same. It's just another way of writing the inside. Because again, this two on the inside, if now you pulled it out, it would be two, it'll get squared, and it'll cancel the four, and you'll have exactly the same answer up there. There's two different ways to do it. It's not integration by part. I don't think that works. So that's number one part A. Okay. Uh, one B uh, is, so it's the integral of x squared minus 4x over x2 minus x squared plus 1. This one is just a straight up u substitution. And du is 3x squared minus 12x, which you, if you realize this is 3 times x, x squared minus 4x. So it's kind of important that that x squared minus 4x matches up exactly with what's inside. If it didn't, this problem would be much harder. So it's nice and balanced. I just have to deal with this three. So when I do the u sub, I get one third, one over u v u. And so I get one third of the natural log. And then I replace. And I get one third the natural log of all that mass. And technically, it's absolute value. So we just kind of leave it in. So that's the answer to point B. Integration by u sub. Um, C, C has multiple ways to do it. Um, one is just, you know, method one here, method one, is just to multiply it out. I'm not going to do that one, but you can just do two minus x times two minus x times two minus x times two minus x times two minus x, distribute it all out, multiply that by x, and then integrate each term. And you can do that, and that's fine. Um, method two, if we did uh, u sub on this, we can do u equals two minus x. Then when you substitute that in, it looks a little strange because you'll have u to the fifth. Uh, du, and this is where I think, just be careful, it's minus dx. So we're going to pick up a minus. And then the other x. This is the sneakiness here is that this u sub here, I have to use it again to get x is 2 minus u and then substitute that in. So it's like a full substitution, not just for the 2 minus x in the fifth power, but this. And you're like, does this make it any easier? And the answer is yes, because I can distribute this through. I get the integral of 2u to the fifth minus u to the sixth. And that's kind of just straightforward. So it'll be a u to the sixth over six, but it also has a two in front, so it'll just be a three minus u to the seventh over seven. And then when you replace, I guess we can distribute this minus two. You'll get two minus x to the seventh over seven minus two x minus six over six. And then it's a matter of x not over six to the two. And so that's one way to do it. You can do an integration by parts as well, and you get a very similar answer to this. You just have to make a little bit of algebra to make it look like that. I'm just going to skip that one for now. But you can do it by integration by parts too. Uh, D was 8x to 4x. And you could just pull the 8 out as a constant multiple, or you can do integration by parts and just do 8x and to 4x. So we use Lipter or Lee 8. Algebra becomes before exponential. So we put the 8 up here. U prime is 8. D is not e to the 4x, but e to the 4x over 4. Be so careful on that. So when I write this out, there's uv. So u times v has 8 over 4, so it'll be 2. X e to the 4x. And then minus the integral of v and u prime. So eight and four again cancel to two e to the four x dx. 
And now when I put D here, so when I integrate that out, I get a two x to the four x. Integrate this one, I'll have a half e to the four x. And then plus two. So again, I'll do the antiderivative of that, and it's e to the four x plus four, and the four and the two cancel. So that's the integration of parts. E, e, you just, you know, this is one that there are three of these formulas that you just have to look in the book and realize which one it is. So when you have two signs together, then the answer is the substitution for that is one half the cosine where you add them together, or sorry, when you subtract them, minus the cosine for when you add them. So that's the product to sum of two things together. So you'll have a half the integral of the cosine of x minus the cosine of pi. You just have to figure out which of these formulas it is. Two signs gives you a difference of two cosines in the formula. There's two others, but it depends if it's cosine, cosine, or sine, cosine. Okay, so then we integrate, we get one half on each, so that'll be co cosine the integral is sine. The integral of this cosine will be sine, except you divide it by five. And when you divide it by five, you won't need to cube it out to two, the half of it to become a ten. That one. Um, F is, again, we're going through these quickly, the tangent cube, secant cube. So you look at your chart and you're like, okay, so we have um, an odd and an odd. So I know I'm going to use u equals secant eventually. Um, so du is going to be secant tangent. And when you look at these pieces, I've got like a secant. I've got a secant in two places. Uh, we've got a secant in two, but I have too many tangents. So you take one of these tangents off and write it as secant squared minus one. So it'll be uh, one of the secants, one of the tangents. Now let me write it in the other order. So it'll be uh, tangent squared, so it'll be secant squared minus one. And then it will be two of the secants. So that'll be secant squared. So this is like tangent squared, secant squared. And now you take the other two, tangent x and secant x. And now you've got it all lined up. Where this is u, this is u, and this is d. So you'll end up with the integral of u squared minus 1 times u squared du. Distribute u to the fourth minus u squared. Take the antiderivative of one fifth u to the fifth, one third u to the third, and then replace. And you get one fifth u to the fifth minus one third u to the two. Now we can throw our plus two in there. So it all comes from looking at that table and which things are even, which things are odd. And uh, we'll work that out. D is. Um, you can do this in a couple of ways. You can do it as integration by, you, know, you can do substitution. Uh, you probably could do integration by parts. Um, if we just for practice, do this as um, partial fraction decomposition, then I got to write this as x over x plus one squared equals a over x plus one and b over x plus one squared. And this will be a lead into problem two, but that's that's the form. You solve it out, and you'll get that a is uh, one and b is minus one. So you can do the algebra in there. So this is it. So this will be the integral of one over x plus one minus one over x plus one squared. Okay. So partial fraction and decomposition. And now you integrate. This one is the natural log. That's one. And this one you actually have to write is like x plus one to the minus two. So it will be x minus one to the minus one divided by minus one. So if you put all that together, it ends up being one over x plus one. And then that's it. So a power rule and then a log. Um, two was just set it up. 
do not work out the coefficient. A couple of you didn't read that one. Uh, if, you, if you just set up the pieces, then x cubed minus 3x squared plus 2x can be factored as x, x minus 1, x minus 2. You have to be able to factor it. So this is a over x, b over x minus 1, and then c over x minus 2. So that's that thing. B, now when you factor B, it's going to be X and X plus one squared. So you have to, this is just like the problem we just did, uh, if it has a section X. So this is A over X, it's B over X plus one, but this C is over X plus one squared. So because you have a square, you're going to have two terms. And what goes on top is a number of what's the basis, the, the base, the true base, is x plus one. I know it's a square, but it, it bases the number on the inside. So you get um, just constant on the top. And on the last one, um, you've got two copies of a thing that can't be factored anymore, and then you have three copies. So you're going to have five terms. You can have x squared plus three and x squared plus three squared. And then you're going to have x minus 1 and x minus 1 squared and x minus 1 cubed. So five terms, so you've got five things. What goes on top will be either a number or a number x plus another number if the thing cannot be resolved further, irreducible. This is ax plus b, so that's a square. This is cx plus b. This one's e. The next one, the base is x minus 1, so that's just one power, so you get a number. And the same thing with the so, That is the second part. Right there. Um, the grades have been posted. Uh, you know, if you're thinking, looking at what the midterm grade looks like, well, um, let's see. Or, I mean, overall, we've got test one, which is 14%. We've got test two, which is 14%. We've got roughly, I think we've done a little more than half the homework, but roughly half the homework is about 7%. So that means we've completed about 35% done points wise. We're halfway through days wise, but we still have test three, test four, those are each 14%. But then a big daddy, well, and then we also have the other half, the final half. And that's about another, it's around 7%, it might be 6%, you might have done a little more, but then the final is 30. And it's cumulative, which means it covers everything that we have done. And we'll have a day where we can do review it. So the midterm grades are in. Um, if they're good, then great, keep it up. If they're not, then, you know, we should talk. Go through more problems. Uh, the open math lab for tutoring. Um, if you just go to um, the shortcut for this, you can search for it on the website, but it's just uh, BYU slash Merck, so the Math Education Resource Center. And we'll go there, it'll show you a big calendar of like hours throughout the morning, hours throughout the afternoon, hours throughout the evening on some days. Here's the tutor, send them an email. They will set up a Zoom meeting with you, and you can just it's free and you just, you know, you just uh, it helps. It just do lots and lots of problems. Even going back, I mean, the final exam is a lot. It's cumulative. So, anyway, that's enough for me. Um, for today, what we're going to do is uh, finish off 6.8 and finish that. Um, and then 7.1, which is very similar to what we did before, it's just got one little tweak to it. Um, and then along the way, see if you guys have questions or anything. Okay, so recall 6.8 here is called improper integrals. And I never wrote this notation down, but because people just screw it up. And, and you guys will do it too, I'm sure. It just happens. It's bad notation, maybe. They write that one to infinity of one uh, over x squared dx. And people will just work this out, plug in infinity, which makes no sense at all. Uh, but yeah, all right, see if you can do it. Okay. 
what this really means is to take a limit as n goes to infinity of an integral out to a specific point. And this is this is what we did last time. So this means take your function one over y, y equals one over x squared, plot it from one out to some value n, find that area like that, and then let n get larger and see what happens. And that's that's what this means. That's what this, this whole symbol means. And we did it last time and we realized that this integral on the inside, just recopying what we did last time, uh, ended up being one minus one over n. When we, when we did this integral, we stick in the bounds, we got we always got one minus one over n, like nine tenths and then 9,900, so 999,000. And so the point is, is that this limit is one. So that means that the area from one all the way out only accumulates up to one. So that's, 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 uh, that's what we did. Now in the book, you'll see things where they write this. They will actually write this in the book. They will say that either this equals one or they will say that the integral, because it is a limit, converges to one. And I like this one better. I like it better, this first one shorthand, but when you say equals, it really means in the limit, it equals. And so it's just subtle. I mean, we're probably using, we should have like a little subscript L. It's like it means it equals it in the limit. So, yeah. um, with that in mind, if we did try and use their notation, which you'll see in every calculus, this means basically, you know, what is the area starting at one if you were able to go all the way out to infinity? So this one, this one looks pretty similar. It's not one over one squared, it's just one over x. So how can this be any different? So let's see, one over x, um, you know, and, and it out a little bit here. So if this is one, one, I'm plotting the graph y equals one over x. So one, two, I'm at a half, one, two, I'm at a third. And so this graph looks pretty similar. It's not quite the same. Um, and so what we want to do is we want to do the integral from one to a stopping point over here. We call this n and try and figure out what's the area up to that point. So we just calculate this in a normal way. So find the antiderivative. The antiderivative of one over x is the natural log. Mm -hmm. Plug in the bounds from one to n. We're plugging it down to get the natural log of n. I don't need the absolute value anymore because it's positive. Minus the natural log of one. And we remember the natural log of one is equal to zero. So the answer is natural log of it's natural log of n. Would be my answer. So if I stopped at n equals hundred, then the area would be the natural log of hundred. If I stopped at 1,000, the area would be the natural log of 1,000. So the question is, is now, what happens as we let that n get bigger and bigger and bigger? What is happening to the area? So we calculate the limit as n goes to infinity as the natural log of n. And we realize that we've seen this in the logic all section. Natural log just keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger, and never levels off. So that limit is infinity. So what that means in this case is really you can think of the area underneath is never leveling off anywhere. It just keeps accumulating and accumulating and accumulating and accumulating. And it's like the very end of that curve is, is infinite. Um, whereas in the previous problem, the area accumulated just to one. It's just it's a kind of thing. But uh, we say in terms, so we say, in this case, that this indefinite integral diverges because the limit 
is infinity. The limit is not reaching a, 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 finite, a finite number. So that, that's what that word means. And all that stuff there, you have to do all that work just to say that one little thing that the integral one to infinity of one over x yeah, diverges. Okay. So wait, if I so here's a, this one, one over x to one over x squared converge to one, converges to one. But if I just change the bound from a two to a one, then this one diverges. Which is very subtle. But these graphs are you know coming down, they look like reciprocal graphs. But this reciprocal graph is a square, so it's coming into zero a lot quicker than this one to the point that it actually will give you a finite area, whereas the other ones are not. Um, so that's when this is a one and this is a two to get this weird behavior in between. So I think one of the problems in the book might have said, well, what, where's the break point? I mean, if you, if you put in, um, a, a key here, and this joke only works at DMI, but this is a general key um, that what's, what is happening to the behavior depending on the value of P. So we've already seen that if P is one, we will get an integral that diverges. If P is two, then it converges. So what about if P is three? But what happens if P is negative? Um, so let's see. So we want to look for a bunch of these cases. Um, so, okay, yeah. So, so uh, if in the case where p is one, then you get divergence between the areas like infinite. In the case where p is two, then they converge. I'm not going to worry about what two, but it does give me a finite answer for the area underneath. So what about the case where P is zero? It's just one. So when we do the integral from one to infinity of one, which means I draw this graph, Y equals one, and I look at the area all the way out. Now what is that area if I went all the way out? Well, I mean, wouldn't it just be zero in the end? I mean, they're... The area? No, no, in the area. I'm just saying. Never, never mind. That's something. I'm sorry. That's okay. <laughs> would, it, would it be infinity? Yes, the area would be in, in infinity. So in this case, we just say the word diverges. Yeah, I mean, if you went from one to a hundred, the area would be ninety-nine, which would be ninety-nine by one. If I get to a thousand, it would be nine hundred ninety-nine by one. It would be nine hundred. So these numbers get huge as you go along. And so in the case where P is zero, that would get this. Now, in the case where P is uh, negative, is less than zero, then look at what happens to this, uh, to this integral. If you take and you write this where, if, if this is a negative power, what does that mean to do when you raise something to the negative power? And it means to flip it. Take the reciprocal. Now we get something like this, where it's x to um, this new power. I guess we just write x to the value of two here. Um, I'd now flip it up. Now these guys look like this, starting at one. They go up. <laughs> well, now we're talking about the area all the way out there. That those are huge. Oh, I'm just gonna say, why would the case be where it, where it's to p is equal zero or is less than zero? I mean. But it kind of, I mean, we don't really have much of an idea at the moment, so I'm just wondering. Yeah, in the end, we're going to want to try to combine all these into just one simple rule, but now we're just looking at specific cases. Okay, okay. I, okay, I think I'm just Yeah. Now, I, I do want to make this point. Look, <coughs> what about this one? One over x of x cubed. We tried one over x cubed. This one, I, you know, I want to do, without working it out, I'm going to do it in a slightly different way. So I'm going to compare what is the difference between y equals 1 over x cubed and y equals 1 over x squared. So if you compare those two, then they both start at 1, 1. 
but even at two, the first the y for x squared will give me a quarter, whereas the other one gives me an eighth, one over x. So one of them is going to be sort of here, and the other one is going to be down here. And then as you go out, what about a three? This will be a ninth, whereas the other one will be a twenty-seven. So if I come down and I draw a curve on the top, that one's the x, the x squared. The x cubed will come down and be even smaller. And it's hard to draw because these numbers just get so small super fast. But we know that the x cubed, one over x cubed graph is below. So if we look at the area for x cubed all the way out versus the area for x squared all the way out, which one is going to be bigger? Area? And the answer is this one. The area is going to be bigger. And this area, so and this will have the smaller area. The area is smaller. So that means that if I did the integral from one to infinity of one over x squared, that's going to be bigger than the area from one to infinity of one over x cubed. And I already know that this guy right here converges to one. So that means that the area under this curve for the x squared all the way out is like one. So what does that say about the area for the other one? The area for this one, for this one is less than one. So you can also say that this converges towards I don't know what the area, we can calculate what the area is, but sometimes in the homework it just says, does the area converge to some finite number or does it diverge to infinity? If that's all you cared about, is it getting a finite, be a finite number or an infinite number, then in this case, if you can make it, you know, this is smaller than an area we already know is one, therefore it has to be an area, something less than one. And so you would say it converges as well. So if this is a three, uh, this whole thing would converge. If it was a four, it would be even smaller because these numbers, these fractions would be even smaller. So the sort of summary on this is that the integral of one over x to the p splits into two cases. It either converges if p, if p is uh, greater than one. Is two, three, even one and a half, 1.1. These actually do work. And it will diverge if p is one or less. So the break even point is at one. And if the p is bigger, it will converge. If the p is smaller, then it will diverge and you'll get an infinite area. So it's pretty subtle, but um, there's a break point for these two general p, 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 p. Which, which will also be helpful in later problems where you might have something like, well, what about this? One over one to infinity of e to the minus x squared dx. And in this case, you can't do an antiderivative. There is no antiderivative to this thing. If you plot y equals e to the negative x squared, starting from one, we're starting from zero, it comes down and it looks, it's the bell curve. That's what that one looks like. And so you're talking about the area uh, all the way out there. But you don't know what the antiderivative is, so how do you even work it out? And the answer is, is you try to compare it against one of these uh, P, P one over P things that we already know. So if you also plot y equals one over x squared, then that one ends up looking like this. So that's y equals one over x squared. So if you look at the area, again, we've already done this one. If you look at the area under that one, this integral, this area gives me a finite area. The area is one, so it converges to one. And well, yours is smaller. Your area is smaller than that. So why do you exactly have two graphs at this point though? Or why do we have two functions? I'm trying to, this is the, this is the one I'm trying to figure out. And 
How do you figure this out? You have to do an antiderivative. And there is no antiderivative of e to the minus x squared. And so if you can't do an antiderivative, you know, what are you supposed to do? Uh, and the answer is you interpret this as an area. And so the question is, is that a finite area or is it an infinite area? And I don't know. I don't know if it's an infinite area or finite area. So the best I can do in this case is compare it against an area I already know. And I already know the area uh, one over x squared. That area is one. And so if I can compare my function against another function, and it's not obvious that it's supposed to be one over x squared. I just sort of picked that one because it's an easy one to use. That if I did plot this against it, I would create a curve that would create a larger area than the one that I actually have. And if that larger area is a finite number, what does that say about the smaller area? And this must be a smaller area. Than one. And so you would say that the integral converges to something less than one. This second part here, we just kind of sometimes leave off. We could say, well, it converges to something that's less than one, and that's sometimes all we need to care about. If you wanted to actually figure out what it is, then you'd have to do some kind of trapezoid rule or Simpson's rule. And that would only work from one to n. You have to maybe come up with a pattern to figure out a good estimate for this. And it's just hard. You, this, it's hard to figure out what the exact answer is. Sometimes all I care about is whether it actually gives me an answer or not. So that's sort of the shorthand reason why you'd want to do that. Um, one, one, more, one more in here is you might have an example that looks like this, where it doesn't have an infinity in there, uh, but it does have a bad point in there. So, um, so if you did plot this one, what would, it, what would it look like now? So I do y equals 1 over x. I plot that. And now what area am I talking about here? It's not from one out to infinity, it's from zero to one. So I'm talking about this range here from zero to one, this area. Uh, and the problem is, is I mean, this, <laughs> what's happening here? I mean, uh, the, um, I don't have any point at zero, it's an asymptote. So how do I deal with that? Uh, and, and the answer is it's just like we do infinity. We take infinity out, replace it with a number, and then take a limit at the end. So what we do is we first do an integral from a number up to one, and then we will let that number get closer and closer and closer to zero and see what happens. Just like before, we did n to the n goes to infinity. I think the book might use a b instead because. I don't know. Using a different way. So let's first calculate this, and then we're going to let b at the limit as b goes to zero to positive values. So I only want to talk about positive values. Um, so let's calculate that. How do you do that? Well, you do the antiderivative, which is the natural log of x. We're evaluating it from b to 1. And then I plug in the bounds, so I get the natural log of 1 minus the natural log of b. And the natural log of 1 is um, 0. Uh, the b numbers are all between 0 and 1. Now b is maybe like here. And every time you take a natural log of a number between 0 and 1, it's negative. So this looks bad, like you're subtracting it off, but the area is positive. Well, that's because these guys right here are all going to be negative. So it'll be a negative of a negative. But anyway, what, what happens as you take the limit as b goes to 0, 
of negative natural log of b. So, so what happens if you plug in numbers into natural log that are like 0 0.1, 0 0.01, 0 0.001, 0 0.0001? Um, it turns out that these numbers get really big but negative. So this part right here is going to negative infinity, which means the whole answer is going to positive infinity. So that's not a negative of a negative. So what that means is even this area in here is divergent. Or you can think of this as having infinite area in here. Where we would just write that this integral here diverges. Which is just kind of weird. I mean, it's cruising in, but you have to, if you have infinite area, if you went all the way out. And we've already shown you have infinite area if you go all the way out this way. We've already done that from one to infinity. And, and actually, if you think about it, you do a line here, but the area under the curve here is, basically, is the same as the area there because it's symmetric on both sides. So you could probably leave it out if this area is infinite and that area is infinite as well. But that's that's the problem. And one more thing I'll at least say before you before we uh, take this break here is I think maybe one of the problems might look like this. So you take the integral from negative one to one of one over x squared dx, and you just try it. So this is sort of like blindly. Uh, well, let's just do it. What's the antiderivative of 1 over x squared? So find will be my antiderivative. I get negative 1 over x, and I plug in the bounds, and I'll get negative 1 minus a minus 1 over minus 1. So you're like minus 1, minus 1, and I'll get minus 2 as my answer. Now, the problem with that is look at all the numbers on the inside. They're 1 over x squared. All these things are positive. So you're saying that I take an integral of everything that's positive and I get a negative area? That's not, that's not possible. Uh, and the reason is if you actually plot this out, the, integral or the, the function looks like this. And it has an asymptote in the middle. So the problem is, is you're kind of trying to do the area in there, but because there's an asymptote, you actually can't do the antiderivative across an asymptote. So we, we didn't ever, we never, we weren't really precise before of when you could do this like fundamental theorem. So you just integrate and plug in the bounds, and it's easy. The problem is you cannot integrate. As they say, across uh, an asymptote. It gives you gibberish. Because it's possible that this, you know, it's like the two infinities coming together, and, or maybe it's not infinity. I don't know. We could break this up into like zero to one and, um, and negative one to zero. You know, and then figure out what those two are. And I think it turns, I mean, it turns out that the integral from one to infinity of one over x squared, that area in there is infinite. And so you can't just like combine these things together. Uh, this would be infinite, this would be infinite. So really, this whole thing diverges. Um, you get two infinities put together. So that definitely is infinity. Uh, but if you tried to integrate across the asymptote, you get negative two, and the answer is you can't, you can't do that. So um, you have to worry about these weird breaks you know, when, you, when you're doing these problems. So I think that kind of finishes up 6.8. Um, you don't have the homework if you you know if you submitted it, that's fine. If you want to finish it up for tomorrow, that's fine too. Uh, we can go over some of the homework problems in there. Again, it's just on completion to make sure you've made an attempt and you answer the question. So um, let's take a quick break. We'll come back at like 10 37 and uh and, and do seven one. And I'm running out of slides, so I'm gonna have to stop and come back. But we'll see if we can squeeze some stuff in. So okay. quick break.
and see you in about five minutes. Um, sorry, I just have one question. It's not really exactly mathematics related or visual problems. It's just in general about the class. Yeah. Um, you, what was it?